In the year 2200, humanity became vaguely aware that their caretakers were up to something. It began far from the landing pages, presented amid other goings-on across the terrestrial, as it was called. A modest bullet-point list mentioned, in summary, an experiment centuries in the making. The wording ensured nothing was thought of it, for such grasps at profundity were the bread and bean curds of the sustainability initiative. They would describe their own work with such embarrassing passion that it was widely agreed they must in fact be doing nothing at all. And who could blame them, for to serve the planet as they did was the chore to end all chores, a turn of phrase that applies here literally. This time though, the matter began popping up everywhere. Votes on the nature of celebrations, invitations to experience related broadcasts, insidious paper notes left on virtual desktops which would reel off the entire history of the project if you looked at them for too long. What schoolchild didn't already know about the gate? And what adult didn't already know that it was not a gate, but a twin pair of black claws that floated silently in the outer solar system? It was virtually nothing, for almost anything virtual was of greater import at that time. It made for a nice earring design, and that was about the most people cared for it. Clearly it had not always been that way. Humanity of the 20th century had obsessed over this gate at great expense. They gave it a suitably luxurious name, the Black Crown. They would wait for years with bated breath for their clumsy probes to scratch a secret from the cosmic dust. But as the wait grew longer and longer, life went on, and then away. The Black Crown wasn't going anywhere, or doing anything, and who could care any less about something like that? Everyone presumed that there must be an extremely interesting explanation, but that could be said of so many other things. And other things had explanations that were forthcoming by the graces of their writers. By the time humanity were done sorting themselves out across the 22nd century, the Black Crown was just another asteroid. It was only of interest to the gravitational mass of bureaucracy forming out of the nation-states, a mass that coalesced into the sustainability initiative. This tightening wad of technocrats was to deal with the physical world, with the terrestrial, in humanity's stead. They ruled the terrestrial with absolute power, but had absolutely no power over most goings-on in the virtual, where lives were lived more fully than ever before. They became another barrier between matters like the Black Crown and the average person, to whom terrestrial matters were not only occurring outside of their day-to-day -day realm, but on the other side of a great impenetrable guardian, the Initiative. Much as one knows little of the sewers beneath their feet, people came to know little of the domestic tribulations on the other side of their virtual interface, and those that did were in most cases working for the Initiative. In the 2170s, the Initiative came into possession of a rather large space station, from which further probing of the crown could be brought into budget. That this was the case is more remarkable than it sounds, for the initiative was beholden to its administrative mission. It was, in older terms, like learning the postal service had seized an oil rig and were planning to map the sea floor. These space projects were by and large conducted by a handful of high-ranking peers only, sometimes without proper authority from the people. Such was required, for their government was a form of direct democracy, albeit with a large catch. The voters were so removed from the matters being voted on, that popular control was rarely exerted. It was thanks to this glaring yet unassailable flaw, that the sustainability initiative steered humanity towards the stars, bit by bit. In their scant breaks from keeping humanity safely tucked in, they reached out across the solar system and finally found what had been under the very fingers of the earlier manned missions. When the thick white gloves of the old pioneers had brushed across the gate's surface, they felt and saw only iron. Boring old iron, of all things. What they had missed were the works of molecular art inscribed across the entire hull. The initiative's microscopes revealed it all. And for weeks, months, humanity was alive with hope and cheer. It was a message from a source contested without end. Suddenly, gods were real, 
but maybe only one of them, or perhaps it was one they hadn't thought of yet. The years wore on, and with not a mote of progress decoding the stuff, humanity wore out. The overreach of the SI became less forgivable to the enthusiastic followers of terrestrial matters, and they were able to silence any Black Crown projects for many years. But by the 2190s, these power brokers had passed on or drifted to business in other worlds. Sensing opportunity, a young peer proposed an all-in mission to decode the Crown's secrets with civilian computational power. While almost all humanity would encounter the bumps this CPU siphoning entailed, not many learned of this before the project passed the General Assembly. This was the defining legislation of the 22nd century, entirely because of what it would mean for the 23rd. It was the neat year 2200 when those annoying pop-ups informed the people of Earth that the great cosmic experiment was beginning. The atomic scrawl on the crown had not been art, but instruction. Instruction on exotic science that could turn an ordinary ship into a galaxy trotter. To summarize the theory, while all space had been made equal, someone had altered that since. There was a network of paths, so to speak, between certain stars. They were enthusiastically called hyperlanes by initiative marketing. Earth lay at the junction of three such curiosities. These paths, invisible from the outside and inaccessible without the secrets the Black Crown bore, were shortcuts. If one could look down a hyperlane, it would be like peering at a distant star through a telescope. Then, if you clambered into the telescope, you would fall out the other side and see that star just as large with your naked eyes, for you really were there now. This was a concept readily familiar to Earthlings, for whom teleportation and warping of space was a part of everyday virtual life. This familiarity contributed to the disinterest in the news that the first ever human expedition through a hyperlane had just blasted off from the SI station close to the sun. Yushin Ishikawa, the captain, was the very image of a so-called floater, that being one who had lived their life in space. His skin was not quite pale, but perhaps grey, and his hair was flat and monochrome. He spoke as one might write, wrote as one might dance, and danced not at all. He was precisely the outcast the sustainability initiative was always sure to reel in. That he was the face of this mission seemed a joke to the Earthlings, but on the other hand, he was no great loss were he to disappear into that strange galactic plug hole. Yushin and his ship, the Aldrin, reached the outer solar system in a few weeks, then disappeared with a sudden flash of light. Minutes later, he appeared on screens across Earth, sporting an ugly grin. Behind him was the writhing blue flame of Sirius A, more than eight light years from Sol. These images, traveling the same hyperlane he had, were the beginning of a very great change for humanity. Still not an especially interesting one to most, but the consequences were yet to reveal themselves. Sirius was populated with various stellar bodies, much as the Sol system was. The Aldrin logged asteroids, planets, planetoids, and of course, performed a data-gathering flyby of the cool binary stars revolving at the center. Not since the invention of space telescopes had such an overwhelming deluge of information been feasted upon by the scientific community. It was a feast held under the table, so to speak, for the sustainability initiative had limited resources for their business in space, and most were doing their actual job. That being, to begin the transfer of material from the outer planets and moons back to Earth. To preserve humankind was the SI's only purpose, and what humankind did with the lives the SI granted them was no one's business. Looking beyond the human pale at the mathematics of the hyperlanes or the dark planets of a far-off binary pair was of immense interest to the Council of Peers, but of no clear value whatsoever to the people. And by now, the people were starting to learn that resources were being wasted on expensive space missions and not on their own well-being. So it was that amid the constant ferrying of ores from Callisto or charged gases from Uranus, only one other craft was spared to gaze out of those magical telescopes and slip away. 
Some eight months after Captain Yushin departed, the SIS Zheng He under Captain Antonia Torres flashed into one of the other two hyperlanes away from Seoul. It was pointed squarely at humanity's old muse, the Alpha Centauri system. Torres had been pushed onto the mission at the insistence of her domestic syndicate. They had found no other way to oust the soft-spoken Spartan from her seat on their committee. Strangely, the Council of Peers forced the syndicate to hold elections just days later, with all the incumbent officers barred from standing. Such was the attitude of First Peer Meiji towards the merest hint of ulterior motives, and indeed such was the depth of power the SI held over the ground-level administration of Earth. Torres left Seoul to great attempts at fanfare, lauded as a citizen scientist of Earth, albeit one who refused to appear on camera. Yushin, on the other hand, was one the cameras refused to point at. With almost no attendance to his command votes at all, he was literally left to his own devices. He had sent probes out through the lanes discovered out of Sirius, and had followed one of them himself when a rare neutron star was found. It was called Mufrid, and there he established himself to gather enough research data to last a lifetime. Over the course of the following months, Earth's attention was earned. First, in November, the Black Crown event. It was a harmless magic trick, in which a shudder of space-time had spat a shattered planetoid out of the nothing between the crown's claws. The drifting debris was no threat, but it was a message. The black crown was awake, and its power was real. What had noticed the SI accessing the hyperlanes, and what did this response mean? For the first time in living memory, something of genuine interest was happening out in the terrestrial, and the novelty of this allowed the news greater discussion than even later, far more important developments. The forgotten mystery out in the real world was alive again. The people gave out the mandate for research to be done, but whatever deific power was behind this, it was beyond any detector or expedition. And so, humanity simply had to go back to their business now aware that an ancient power was almost certainly working some machinations beyond the bounds of the terrestrial. It was a stunning thing to know, but also numbing. It was like dangers witnessed in the world of a movie or game, with the heroic sustainability initiative already in place to deal with it. The distinction between apathy towards some vampire threat in old Victorian England and this rock-spitting enigma out on the terrestrial faded away with the year's end. Then came February 18th, 2201, B-Day as it would later be termed, for if Earth was planet A, what Torres had found on Alpha Centauri 3 made that green-blue marble planet B. The blue part, water, the green part, alien life. This was no dead bacteria on an asteroid, this was a fully functioning alien ecosystem evolved on a world extremely similar to Earth. Nothing was exactly waving back, but it was the inevitable proof that many had been waiting for, that life was a fact of the universe. The planet next door was teeming with critters, and it was first come first served insofar as rights to merchandise their likenesses. Thus, between Yushin and Torres, it was the latter's discoveries that were going to make the headlines. It had been a long time since a single headline had made it to the ears and eyes of all humanity. Planet B was a wake-up call, a call that signalled the revived relevance of the terrestrial, which, despite resistance, came to refer to all that was not virtual. That something was going on with the Black Crown and the Hyperlanes was nice and all, but Planet B brought about something that humans could do themselves, the planet had breathable oxygen and fluffy quadrupeds. Those who couldn't find their way on Earth had somewhere else to go. Votes for a base on Planet B got closer and closer to passing, and a fascination with this complex new stranger-than-fiction story created a major subculture of Planet B mania. A year after B-Day, which is when this term was coined for it, Yushin got his revenge. He had landed on Murfid-1, one of the neutron star's thoroughly baked satellites. He was chasing a blot on the planet's heat map, no bigger than a human, yet detectable from orbit on the Aldrin. He sent back pictures of what he found. 
a yellowish slab of rock streaked with neatly carved text. One could be sure it was text, for the reverse side linked the symbols used to shapes, numbers, and more perplexing pictograms. It was the basis for translation, surely left deliberately. It would take an extreme feat of chance for this discovery to not be a smoking gun on the matter of intelligent alien life at large in the galaxy. Such a notion was almost required for the Black Crown and the Hyperlanes to fit anywhere into humanity's understanding of science. And this was it. It was such a perfect find, from such a strange and hopeless location, that Yushin was slammed as the greatest fraudster in all academia. It should be noted that no one in said academia was willing to go so far, but they must have had their doubts, especially given the shadow cast by Torres. The distant hermit of a neutron star may well have lost his mind, some surmised. Yushin had to bring his prize to market himself. He and his crew began translating the tablet. He was, for a time, suspended from the SI for this. But his rank was reinstated following a jarring happening in Seoul, the second Black Crown event. Power surged in the bent arms of the twin machines, and after a brief ripple, something appeared. It was called a Space Amoeba, a name hiding its scale. Its image was that of a quadruple-tailed tadpole, limey in color and bordered by brilliant luminescent frills. Cute enough to merchandise, one supposes, but Earth was not in the mood. Or at least, of the 16% voting on the matter, 60 were of the opinion that the creature be forcefully expelled. The Council of Peers could not disagree, for they had nothing they could say of the creature that met any sort of rigorous standard of proof. All that could be said was that its frills afforded its mountain-sized form some mobility even in the near vacuum, and it was swimming to lower and lower orbits of Sol. Obliging the fears raised on Earth, the SI sent its grand battle fleet into action. This fleet, totaling three vessels and zero crew, was borrowed from the Sol station. There they had the duty of destroying debris and rocks approaching the hull, and as such were equipped with ice-melting lasers and pummeling mass drivers. Everyone had their own image of conflict between humans and the unknown aliens surely lurking in the cosmos, and this battle between a drifting shiny sponge and three clueless safety measures was not it. That the amoeba spat fluids out at the drones was interesting, but had no bearing on the encounter's result. The creature was scorched and perforated without relent until it ceased to alter its course. Over the next few days, its luminescence faded, and the great first contact war was over. The SI managed to allocate itself an additional research vessel to go dock with the great carcass and keep it from falling into Sol. One Shu Suma was made captain amid strong competition. To become the first xenobiologist was an honor the SI would make sure stood the test of time, after all. The people voted Captain Shu in very much on the basis that she made no fuss about this honor, while the rest of the candidates wasted valuable seconds expressing their humility in the face of it. Her earliest reports claimed that the amoeba was still alive, but this was revised later to merely be a mistaken impression of its remarkable regenerative properties. This creature registered as being incredibly young, with no cell aged beyond a year. Yet new cells were being spat from the old without end. The crippling radiation of space was overcome by a continuous process of rebirth. Xu Sumar and her crew on the SIS scout were tasked with finding out how the regenerative process avoided mutation or cancerous growth. Truly this strange visitor was another gift from the Black Crown in this regard. But its origin, its intention, and its connection to the mysteries of the era, these matters stirred up fear like nothing else outer space had to offer. Captain Yushin was reinstated and received copious praise for his distant, nearly forgotten scholarship. He reminded the well-wishers that his work could have nothing to do with the Black Crown. He was ignored and wished well further. Towards the end of that year, 2202, a gathering of cargo craft took place in Earth's orbit. They were about to embark on the Sustainability Initiative's most ambitious project, to secure Planet B. 
Thanks to their prior work, humanity did not require an additional planet, but some noisy wards were clamoring for it all the same. The SI's stated goal was to preserve humanity's economy forever, which in a pure sense meant that they couldn't rely on anything that might not last forever. But forever was a long time, and even the stars would betray their residents eventually. This inconsistency was the gap in their armor, through which flowed calls for Alpha Centauri and its verdant gardens to be mixed into the great throat of Earth's industry. It would certainly make things easier. So with a gust of popular support in their sails, the Council of Peers cut up an old space station in low Earth orbit and shipped it down the hyperlane to Captain Torres over the coming year. Torres spent the first half of that year conducting an economical survey of the system. Wherever she and the SIS Zheng He went, a growing fleet of utility craft flocked at their backs, left to probe mineral-rich asteroids and the strange ices of frozen moons. She was very clear in her reports. These resources were expendable and were hence useless. But like her old comrades in her home syndicate, the Earthlings were not convinced. On Earth, the so-called Little Exodus was already beginning. The SI called it colonization fever and treated it very much as a disease. Colonizing an alien planet was just about the last thing a biological creature should want to do, it was reasoned, yet the evidence said otherwise. The idea of creating an additional Earth was the most popular notion ever pinned to the SI, and as such it was hard to ignore. It was orders of magnitude easier to colonize Earth orbit than another solar system, but it lacked the punch to get any excitement down through the interference between reality and the Earthlings. Hoping things would turn out differently, the SI had, years prior, built great cylindrical habitats above Earth, prototypes for some very livable abodes in the comfortable light of Sol. These were, like that old space station, broken up and folded away for transit. A few thousand SI members were recruited for the burgeoning colonization project, while the Earthlings gave their utmost approval and awaited the good news. Some even asked to go themselves, but that really was a breach of the SI's responsibilities. While work on a huge colony craft trickled along reluctantly, demand for maps of the hyperlanes became the next terrestrial intrigue. Several had been detected shooting off from Alpha Centauri, and down one of them, Torres was sent. From Earth, too, Shu Suma was ripped from her lodgings astride the unrotting amoeba to pilot the scout through the final lane away from Sol. With more people than ever before tuning in to the terrestrial, the SI seemed to bend as much as it could bear to make them feel welcome. And with the welcome extended, this new audience bid that adventure and discovery be had, so long as it was not too time-consuming to follow. Such was the casual optimism of 2203. There was so much out there, more than a human could appreciate, but it seems the humans of the day at least wished to try, or order someone else to try. And that, ultimately, was what the Sustainability Initiative was for. Of their 30 million staff, about 7,000 had now been spared for this curious project to expand the reach of the terrestrial, including three elected peers. Their journey beyond the bounds of humanity's guardian bureaucracy was justified in the dry words of First Peer Meiji. To preserve humanity forever, we must understand the arena in which we are to be preserved. That overcoming its trials will be difficult is not a concern, for to allow it to overcome us would be the lesser result. Her use of the term arena was questioned at first, but deemed prophetic later. Her words foreshadowed the sobering message to humanity that was to arrive that September, and the testing discoveries burning in its wake. 300 million years ago, the dying star Murphid had shone down on the spires of an alien civilization. That was until the War of Extermination detailed in the recovered stone inscription. Captain Yushin claimed as such, with a sense of glee poorly transmitted in his dry report. The Earthlings debated whether he was to be trusted, but the Sustainability Initiative reviewed Yushin's work and concluded it was sound. 
His translation of the lost alien message was about as good as it got, but there was one major contention left unsettled. Which of the two civilizations mentioned had been the aggressor in this terminal conflict? It was an irrelevant debate. What Yushin had found was evidence that someone had been building an empire across the galaxy hundreds of millions of years ago. There was little doubt that the Hyperlane system was their legacy. This memorial to the Murphid Holocaust, another. It was theorized that the barren state of the Murphid system was not just because of a supernova blasting away most of the star, but because the perpetrator race had stripped once living worlds bare. These perpetrators, unnamed in the inscription, were called the Precursors. Their victims were designated the Murphid Civilization, awaiting further clues from the system. However, the Precursors had been thorough. There was no trace of their victims. The word of these self-indicting exterminators was all the evidence of this long-lost society available. Yushin's search was not wasted though, for his stumbling through this mystery brought him to another. In early 2204, he reported that the Murphid system was host to a wormhole. This made it the second long-theorized feature of the cosmos found in the system. This wormhole was unstable, making dramatic belches of dust only to draw it back in. Yushin, who already had enough data to keep him writing to the grave, was besieged by wonder and discovery on all fronts. Far away, his data was being processed by the people and peers of Earth. Humanity had an important answer to a long-standing question. There was indeed other intelligent life in the galaxy, and in the prior billions of years of the Milky Way's existence, these civilizations had come and gone. Yes, it was exactly the kind of profound but useless information the people wished the SI would calm down about. Perhaps something more interesting was required. How about an alien civilization that was still around today? It was what the Earthlings had sardonically demanded instead, and a few months later, the SI delivered. Two hyperlane jumps from Earth in the Kazon system, Xu Sima had found a lush green world. It would be planet C, but something was wrong. The atmosphere was packed with carbon, the land was streaked with enclosures, and the dark side of the planet was a glittering array of yellow lights. Some Earthlings speculated that at last the secret enclave of a mysterious 20th century dictator had been discovered, but Kazan II was no human world. It was, however, a place reminiscent of the 20th century. Xu Suma reported detecting vapor trails in the skies and big smoky cities dotting the land masses. The beings living there were emitting radio signals and from them, Xu Suma picked out the name Evendari as the likely term for their species. This is, of course, simply a rough approximation of the true sound of the word. On Earth, everyone wanted to know what these beings looked like, and an expedition to get some eyes on the ground began to materialize. For some in the SI, this discovery came a little too hot on the heels of the precursor revelation. The reason Xu Suma had approached Kazan II was to assess its resources, but since they were in the hands of another, lesser civilization, what was to be done now? If the SI was to preserve humanity forever, what were they to do with the Evendari? To condemn the precursors was easy, but was this their decision too with the Murphid civilization? At least they had regretted their actions enough to leave a memorial. The Earthlings might take some convincing to vote for the same. The Precursors were probably around to see animals first walking on land on Earth, but they had stayed their hand then. Was it mercy or disinterest? Or was it the doing of whatever turned the Precursors to dust between then and the present? That summer, another point in the timeline emerged. Captain Torres, exploring the hyperlanes beyond Alpha Centauri, found artifacts from a more recent era. Digital devices buried in thick sand were excavated from an unusual geographical depression on the planet Elfard II. The devices were using binary data, and while most of it was incomplete or indecipherable, a morsel was unpacked. 
it was an image, a map of the hyperlanes around the Alphard system. Alphard was centered in a quadrant of the galaxy, and various parts were labeled with unknown symbols. A large area was grouped with a shaded background, with variant shades marking smaller areas within it. After a few weeks, the peers released their analysis. The symbols were names, and metadata in the image contained repeated use of a string of binary seen throughout the recovered datasets. It appeared to refer to the number 1, in tandem with an unknown collective noun. Taking it to be the identity of the creators, they were dubbed the First League. They were, it was assumed, a collection of different civilizations, all extant at once. The sediment around the finds was dated at 2 million years old. That narrowed down the lifespan of civilization a couple more orders of magnitude. It was one thing to learn that a 300 million year old society was gone now, but a 2 million year old one struck a little closer to the present. The earthlings of that era fancied their chances at carrying on into the late black hole era of the universe, for indeed their existence in the virtual could tick along quite happily even as the stars went out and space-time settled into cold homogeneity. Now it seemed they had no chance of even seeing Sol grow old. Something was ending civilization wherever it rose across the galaxy. For the pessimists, it was an old theory proven correct, that civilization was inherently self-terminating. After all, if there were any resources left in the galaxy, it follows that the civilizations that came before didn't get especially far. At least two civilizations had been within a couple of weeks' flight of Earth, even by SI ship velocities, and neither had settled in. Someone had made the Black Crown, that much was clear. Cosmic radiation had made accurate dating of the crown impossible, so it couldn't be pinned to either known power. But Earth was on the First League map, so that was a strong connection. Evidently, the half-dozen civilizations of the Quadrant had disappeared before they had snapped up the prime real estate. Was that a fact of life in the galaxy? It was enough to sink the stomach as humanity's own interstellar colonization project entered its next phase at the end of the year. Thousands of SI crew were packed into a gigantic hauler above Earth, partially made from recycled space habitats. Geared up with all the SI could afford to spare, they blasted off for a three-month-long trip to Alpha Centauri III, Planet B. On the journey, the planet was given an official name, Bounty. It was so named for its wealth of plant life, its deep lakes awash with flecks of precious metals, and for the rich veins of minerals Torres had logged all across the three primary continents. It was everything the SI needed to sustain humanity for a long time, yet that was now a dark thought. It was right in the middle of First League space, but they hadn't made it there. As the colony ship's wide feet sunk into a wet field of ropey ferns, the paranoid braced for whatever punishment the galaxy must mete out for such behavior. They would not have seemed paranoid at all when, just days later, the Black Crown flared to life with a twist of the space between its claws. Probe saw a small object zoom out from the gate and race out of sight. It was spherical, no bigger than a terrestrial vehicle. It was found again a couple of days later, when SI monitoring stations detected seismic activity on EO. Investigation revealed that this object had slammed into the moon's surface at extreme speed and burrowed itself deep into the ground. Captain Yushin was recalled to Seoul to investigate the matter. His fellow peer, Captain Xu, meanwhile, was busy at work in the Kazon system. In a year-long project, stations were established in orbit over Kazon II, taking care to keep their signatures as undetectable as possible. And even if the Evendari spotted something, what were they to make of it? These stations provided detailed images of the cities and fields spanning the planet. More importantly, they produced images of the Evendari themselves. They were humanoid, which helped with marketing them immensely. Two-armed and two-legged, they were tall, purple-skinned, big-eared, four-eyed, 
and had wide mouths bristling with irregular patterns of thick teeth. They were ugly, perhaps because of all things known to Earth, they most closely resembled a decaying human corpse. Their civilization was a sort of theocratic capitalism, with religious institutions having primary control over both legal and economic decisions. It had been this way for a very long time, from what decoded signals told. The Evindari had a strange curse upon them. They were long-lived, but had very short memories. As such, while they had developed industrial societies, powered flight, and possessed immense knowledge of theoretical physics, their collective achievements had only been brought about very slowly and partially by accident. As far as alien races went, Earth wasn't impressed. Popular imagination had demanded much more. But it was agreed that the Evendari were unlikely to jump out into space and blow up significant buildings on Earth, so they had that going for them. Of course, the resource-rich planet they were on already was going against them, but the SI was able to suppress such sentiment before it was reflected in the electorate. For now then, the discovery of intelligent life simmered down into something of a reality television broadcast, with a few hardcore Evanderites following Earth's sister civilization with scholarly dedication. But there was certainly better content in the virtual. By mid-2207, the EO Impact mystery had seen no progress. Captain Yushin begged to be relieved of the laborious project. For months, a team of excavators had been digging into the moon's surface in pursuit of the Black Crown object, but with little gravity and no oxygen, this was a slow and unrewarding hunt. Yushin was mercifully returned to service aboard the SIS Aldrin, replaced by junior peer Grasser. Yushin's research team in Murfid had compiled a report on the wormhole, which was delivered before Yushin could return to them, for there was no more work to be done. The wormhole had disappeared. A large amount of space junk had emerged from it without warning, and then the anomaly had closed up, leaving unremarkable space and a lot of mess. It was put forward that someone, somewhere, had tried to enter a corresponding wormhole, and this was the result. Yet the recovered metal was weathered, old, and while certainly artificially shaped, was of indiscernible purpose. The notion that the wormhole had effects on the time dimension of space-time could not be ruled out. These pieces, it was imagined, could be remnants of the lost Murphid civilization, spat back to whence they came, but not when. And if they were, then it was a great shame that the junk was quietly recycled to meet the SI's production quota for that year. The quota was only so high because of a popular measure being forcibly implemented. Another manned mission to a new world. A new water-rich planet had been discovered around a red dwarf only two hyperlane trips from Earth. The air wasn't breathable, but that didn't stop so-called colonization fever. Despite the colony on Bounty having produced nothing but expense and illness for the SI, they were beholden to demands for another. In the summer of 2208, the colonists arrived at their new paradise. They called it Paradiso, for it really was a default desktop image of a holiday resort. The days were twice the length of those on Earth, and the land masses were flat and shallow, creating huge beaches along the coasts. It was hot, peaceful and fertile. It was called the Tropical Planet. Again, the air wasn't breathable. But the virtual vistas sent back to Earth wouldn't capture that minor challenge. SI colonists were set down in paradise and told to try to stay alive for as long as possible. First Peer Meiji promised to do all she could to get them home again. If that meant taking adventurous volunteers from Earth and swapping them with the valuable SI personnel, then that was, as they said, what the vote implies. This opened a can of worms, however, as colonization fever spread further through the Earthlings, and some demanded to go to Bounty as well. There was a real threat that the controlled colonization experiments would turn into real colonies, and that the SI would be expected to make it work. It was a source of internal debate, for securing extrasolar resources was one thing, 
but simply expanding the scope of what the SI had to manage would increase the rate of resource exhaustion. But on the other hand, the SI were keeping humanity alive so that they could fulfill their desires, and their desires tended to include reproducing. Such things had been suppressed by Earth's lack of opportunity, but people were learning that the old excuses no longer applied. The virtual equivalent wasn't cutting it anymore. Thus the SI began walking the path that some still feared would bring about their destruction at unknown hands. The third Black Crown event had, so far, proven to be a false alarm. With the case for some galactic culling mechanism rather unfounded, to plow forwards was the only defensible course. Almost as a footnote in history that year, confirmation of extragalactic life was added to Captain Yushin's list of discoveries. He had recovered a strange piece of debris that had impacted the Aldrin, and determined it to be a shaped piece of ammunition. It was dated at over 1 billion years old, and its simulated trajectory had it coming from the Triangulum Galaxy. Perhaps they had a problem with space amoebas as well. It was another discovery of immense implication, but almost no content. It did serve, though, to help outline the boundaries of just how much humanity didn't know about the galaxy, which was a step on the path to real understanding. 2209 was a year of documentation and consolidation. Probes and temporary stations were set up in the systems near Earth, that is, near as the hyperlanes would have it. The Evendari histories were translated and studied, and theoretical work on the precursors and First League carried on orbiting the morsels of data that were available. At the end of the year, much fuss was made of the Council of Peer General Elections, in which First Peer Meiji retained her seat on the promise of furthering the floundering colonization projects. The EO dig inched towards the buried Black Crown object, with equipment failures and personnel turnover sinking most streaks of progress. Peer Grasser claimed that perception of time was being altered by some property of the impact zone, but no instruments were able to demonstrate this. Such apparently ludicrous claims only lengthened her sentence in that academic dead zone. Meanwhile, Captain Yushin was sent to the Tua system in 2210. It was one jump from Alphard, center of the First League. He hoped to find more clues to remedy the scholarly stalemate on the topic, and he succeeded. He found that an asteroid in the system was hiding a mechanical mining facility. It had bored into the asteroid's interior, but was covered in strange patterns of damage. Yushin concluded that it had been partially cut apart by high-energy lasers, and in places endured detonations of some kind. It was a ruin of battle. Whatever the result, the asteroid's remaining minerals had not been extracted, and the machinery had not been repaired. This wreck was a survivor from the final days of the First League perhaps not completely destroyed on account of its hidden location. From it, it could be inferred that their annihilation was no supernatural force, as some had worried. It was conventional in the broad sense of the word. It was cause for hope, for that meant it could, theoretically, be resisted. Yushin's stay in the Toa system was extended into 2211, hunting for more clues. A few months later, Probes detected something phenomenal. A spacecraft fell out of the hyperlane into the Fontral system, just three jumps from Sol. Despite triple checking and more, this was not an SI craft. The symbols on its cylindrical hull match some recovered from the First League data cache, and some seen in the destroyed mine. Did the First League live on? Not at all. The ship was dead, but travelled the hyperlanes on solar fuel searching for something unknown. It was, in effect, just a rather intelligent and functional ruin. Its jagged aft suggested that it was a large-scale mining craft, but evidently the major asteroids of the galaxy remained intact after millions of years. It was simply wandering, perhaps searching for some destination long since destroyed. Destroyed by what? That remained the question. 
Yushin identified more space junk in the tour system with immense age and signs of unintended perforation. The first league, it seemed, had been physically obliterated, piece by piece and with precision. Was it a mistake that buried ruins and automated vessels remained? Or was the objective of the destroyers not to end the First League's matter, but their lives? It seemed removing any clear evidence of their intent was part of their plan. The only lead now was the Black Crown object deep within Eo. It would prove a lead like no other. The alien planet Bounty had a secret. It began to manifest throughout 2211, first hinted at by the strange behaviour of the Earthlings sent to live there. These were excited volunteers, eager to report back on their little adventure on the terrestrial. Their excitement got out of hand quickly. The Bounty Colony Station, resplendent in its prefabricated symmetry, was battered from within by the violent impulses of the colonists. Taking the spirit of colonization to heart, they were also very busy creating Bounty's first homegrown humans, and were happy to do so with such liberation of spirit that the SI administrators decided to shut down the surveillance cameras. The reports called them feral, and it was reasoned that these people were simply acting out in a fashion they had become accustomed to in the virtual, where all of this was of no consequence. More volunteers were hauled down, with those same ships hauling back the pure and rich ores mined from Bounty's surface. The process of eating the galaxy had truly begun. But the violence rose further and further, and promiscuity ran out of control. Indeed, this was something over which the SI had rather unique control on Earth. SI handlers found themselves also taken by these desires of the virtual, and panicked. Groups fled the colony for the humid lands beyond, where quickly they found answers. Where drones had surface mined ores from hillsides, entrances to caves had been created. The interiors of these caves were furry, green like verdant meadows, and soft like an endless sea of pillows. It was Bounty's trap. It was a fungus that fed on surface life by luring it into continent-spanning caves. Its spores wafted up and promoted rapid reproduction, more food for the fungus. The colony, of which roughly half had been rendered uninhabitable by fires after New Year's Eve 2213, was sealed off from the world. Sure enough, with filtering and air quality monitoring systems, the humans returned to their dull selves. The whole ordeal was apparently a cure for colonization fever, but the SI had signed them up for 10 year stints at a minimum. There was work to be done, and plenty of newborn mouths to feed. As the fires had burned on Bounty to welcome in 2213, in the deep pit of Eo, Pier Grasser had bathed in the illumination of an alien wonder. The long dig in pursuit of the Black Crown object had led them to a chamber in which the object lay inert. The walls were lined with metal, which reacted with luminescence to the touch of skin. It was found that an electrical current could produce the same effect, and if all the metal plates were charged in such a fashion, the luminescence created a projection in the air. This projection was data, with symbols matching those Captain Yushin had discovered in Murphid. It was the work of the precursors. It took Grasser only a few weeks to summarize what the symbols meant. It was a straightforward design for what she called the Gateway Cannon a one-way ticket to wherever the Black Crown cared to send you. So then, as 20th century humans had first imagined, it really was a gate. The precursors had carefully included instructions on all the basics, from electric transistors to exotic matter manipulators. They were accounting for all manner of civilizations discovering this buried archive, and clearly wanted to give all of them their one shot through the gate. One shot was all you got, the fuel source for the cannon was to be the Black Crown object, which remained inscrutable. This was now completely beyond the SI's mandate, but a motion to waste good resources on the project passed the People's Forum easily. It was a years-long venture, and was inevitably safely forgotten once that timescale became apparent. Thus the terrestrial fell quiet again, 
but for the two ongoing reality channels from Kazon 2 and Bounty respectively. Further from home, Captains Yushin and Torres had been exploring the hyperlanes, undertaking years-long expeditions between distant stars. They were starting to piece together another blip on the galactic timeline. Many planets were orbited by artificial debris that was far younger than the two million years gone First League. Torres had even discovered writing etched into the surface of a barren planet, etched so large it could be read from space. There was no basis for translation this time, but samples of scorched dirt within the scroll dated the writing to only 5,000 years old. It was scarcely older than humanity's oldest writings. Someone had been roaming the galaxy very recently, but they had not made it even as far as the First League, it seemed. That they had been around while humans were first settling their home planet, reignited theories about extraterrestrial involvement in all manner of earthly civilizational achievements. If it was true, then whatever this previous generation of spacefarers had planned for Earth, they had not lasted to see it to fruition. The evidence lifespan of galactic travelers dropped a few more orders of magnitude. Now, the pessimists argued, humans would be lucky to live to see their old plastic deposits degrade. But things were not so harsh, it was then revealed. The civilization cluttering the galaxy with their floating junk and illegible scrawl was still very much alive and kicking. On the 14th of June, 2214, they said hello. It was the only time they would say it. This so-called first contact was an event long awaited in popular imagination, and like most things the cosmos had to offer, lacked flavor in reality. The senders of the terse transmission were priests of the Uva Zavani, if the term priest had indeed been correctly translated. They simply acknowledged that the humans were taking to the stars, and briefly explained that their own stars were to be left alone on pain of death. Simple as that. It came with a basic data package explaining, for the most part, rituals of civic life in their culture. It was less an educational tour and more a recommendation for how to live. The Uva Zivani took spiritualism very seriously, and it seemed that beyond evangelizing, they wanted nothing to do at all with the humans. A few interesting tidbits were gleaned from their message, however. First, their primary language and stringy engineering style matched up with the writings and ruins from 5,000 years ago. Evidently, the Uva Zivani had once been more widespread, yet they had abandoned the riches of their old empire long ago. Secondly, they at one point referred to humans as other children. The child remark could be explained by the relative ages of each society, but the other term came with plenty of implications. Of course, the Uva Zivani had nothing to say on what children the humans were other to. So then, beyond a rush of initial interest, the people were again disappointed with the SI's terrestrial tales. There were creatures resembling feathered fish who had ruled an ancient empire, and maybe it was they who built the pyramids for whatever reason, but they'd checked out of the terrestrial drama long ago. A perfect cue for the average human to do the same. There were some among the SI who felt similarly. The eternal chore of keeping the food growing, water flowing, and smiles showing wore down even the hardiest of Earth's overlooked stewards. Such was the origin of the Night Garden Enclave in the Sirius system. It was a colony for people who hated colonies, and other people. On a gloomy planet with long nights, tall buildings were plopped down amid leafless alien trees. It was a calm little purgatory, and from then on, SI members would joke and dream of visiting the Night Garden when things got a bit too hectic. If you worked really hard, the SI would make your dream a reality. An afterlife, if you like. An afterlife where you had to work even harder, but you didn't have to look after any bumbling civilians. Paradiso B. There was one SI scientist who had a different kind of escape in mind. Pierce Shu Suma reported to Earth, responding to the merest hint that the mission to activate the Gateway Cannon would have a human pilot. Clearly this was not required, but Shu volunteered. Never too fond of the terrestrial, or its manic imitation in the virtual, Shu imagined that the Gateway would lead to the land of the space amoebas. A true purgatory. 
She didn't imagine for a moment that there would be a way to come back. Xu met with First Peer Meiji in private, and the next day, Meiji made the rare step of advising the Council of Peers to accept a proposal without sufficient grounds. It was only marginally within their constitutional power, but Xu got her way. The black crown object was mounted on the front of a simple frame, dotted with nodes of unthinkably expensive compounds built from the protons up. Inside the frame was an SI ship, packed with a lifetime of supplies and the most powerful transmitters room would allow. On the 4th of April 2215, its orbit was matched with the black crown. Plenty of humans, earthlings and otherwise, tuned in to see the event. As Xu steered her encapsulated ship in between the floating claws, the black crown object let out a burst of brilliant light. The image of the ship writhed in a purple blur, and sparkling traces of hydrogen speckled the vacuum. After just a few seconds, all was gone. It was an experiment with no answer. The black crown worked, or at least it did something but that was the one chance they'd ever get to see it. Some good data was gleaned by sensors, but the grander mystery was at another dead end. What the people didn't expect as they returned to their lives was that this wasn't the last they would hear of Captain Shu Suma. The SI had placed listening posts in the star systems around Earth, with powerful receivers ready to bring in any information Shu transmitted from wherever the gateway had sent her but they were picking up something else instead. Sharp, fast chatter in a language that researchers spent a year deciphering. It was coming from the same hyperlanes that led to the Uvazivani and ultimately revealed some of the other children the elder species had spoken of. After sending messages back the other way, contact was made with a group calling themselves the Tuxcan Combine. This group was the ruling body of a reptilian species located to Earth's southwest on the standardized hyperlane map, perhaps 15 lanes distant. Like the SI, the Combine ruled their species absolutely, but whether their arrangement was voluntary was unclear. They shared an affinity with the Uvazavani, who to them were close neighbors. Most notably, the Tuxcan practiced the unknown Uvazavani religion, with the vocalization for holy being the same in the languages of both species. There was no doubt that this was the result of prior meddling in the Tuxcan's development, a fate that must once have been slated for Earth, too. The Tuxcan were more talkative than their neighbors, but that wasn't an especially good thing. They were belligerent and claimed no hesitation to destroy the SI should offense be given. So then, the official SI policy was to say nothing, for knowing what precisely would cause offence to an alien culture was impossible. It was an uncomfortable silence. In living memory, the humans had been the masters of the universe. In reality, they were just another child species, watched over by the fading remnants of those who came before, and living in the shadow of the eradicated empires of the galaxy's past. And now they had two irrational and antagonistic powers plotting on their doorstep. It was at this time that asteroid defense drones started being refit with long-term fuel supplies and thicker hulls. It had been generations since the last terrestrial military theorist had passed away, but the virtual had plenty to offer. Designs for new combat craft were crowdsourced within days. Was it good enough to win a fight if it came to it? No one knew but it was entertaining to simulate, and certainly got a lot more people engaged in a terrestrial matter, so the SI was all aboard with the war games. In reality, they had no intelligence on their new rival whatsoever, and the Tuxan were ready to kill to keep it that way. Thus, all was quiet on the cosmic front. In 2217, two years after Xu Suma had left for worlds unknown, she returned. Her ship, shattered into pieces, blasted out of the Black Crown, just like the debris from the first Black Crown event. The living quarters were intact, but empty. Only a few months of supplies had been consumed, but those that remained were spoiled by at least a thousand years. An analogue atomic clock found still ticking in another part of the ship confirmed it. The expedition had gone to the future and back, and all that remained of Shu Suma was dust on her bed. Some of the computers were recovered, 
but it seemed that the data left on board had been curated by Xu. Files detailed research she had done on the identical gateway to which the Black Crown was connected somewhere in deep space. She claimed that another civilization had once lived on the other side, but she had erased all the data she had gathered on them. Why? She claimed it was for the good of humanity that they did not know. They were gone when she arrived, and she tolerated knowing the details for the months it took her to extract from their ruins knowledge of how the gateways worked. She had left her ship on autopilot while the gateway gathered energy for a return journey, and taken her own life in the meantime. A thousand years passed, and finally the gateway sent her home, in space and time. Clearly she had intended for more files to be available, but some of the storage glass had been destroyed or left on the other side of the gate. The SI extracted incomplete records on how to activate the gateway, and a fragment of a huge series of logs Xu Suma had made. Only one had retrievable content. It was a recording of her voice, talking to no one in particular. Her despair was evident. That future. My kind will truly know suffering on that baleful day. The day when the sky rains blue fire. Context in her data implied she had created more messages aimed at the sustainability initiative, but nothing survived. The cryptic diary clip was all they had, and it was not painting a hopeful picture. Inferring outwards, the destroyed other civilization had likely experienced this baleful day of blue fire, and Xu believed firmly that humanity had the same destiny of suffering, suffering so great that she could not bear to live and know of it. The fatalist faction within the SI was back on track. Xu Suma's funeral service itself was a bubbling pot of debate, but there was nothing one could pull from the broth. After all, if the doomsayers were right, and some unknown destroyer was absolutely going to step in and cull another flare-up of life in the galaxy, what was the average person to do with that information? This was no god, but a cosmic unknown. There was no negotiation, and much as people wanted to believe that this or that path of action would calm their slayer, there was no reason to believe any of it. This god didn't provide a holy book just apathetic whispers of doom whenever they got around to it. There was no course of action to make things better, or indeed worse. Xu Suma had one response. The alternative was to do precisely what you could do to tackle the problem, nothing. And, of course, to imagine that a reasonable explanation for all this, and for all the destruction of prior life, and for the continued presence of unspoilt resources all over the galaxy, would come with time. All prior great questions had been answered eventually, after all. Humanity would wait and see if they were destroyed, and mind their own business along the way. This was not the precise wording of the SI report that settled the matter, but it was the spirit. So then, haulers continued to take people and prefabs off to mine alien planets, and the virtual carried on its usual hijinks on its own path of wild, wondrous history. Captain Torres was elected first peer in 2220, on the promise that she would allow expendable resources in the systems around Earth to be processed. Seeing as Earth might not actually last forever, the mandate for infinite sustainability was fading away. Perhaps this decision was the trigger, for it was in that very same year that the deliverers of the baleful blue fire burst from the Black Crown on a collision course with Earth. In the middle of 2020, the Black Crown writhed and choked, then spat out ten pips one after the other. The blurry split-second pictures taken of all ten were combined and refined to build a true image. They were space amoebas, of the sort previously exterminated upon sight. The land of the space amoebas really was out there, beyond the gate. In fact, it became clear that Shusima had achieved her dream of finding it. These latest sightings rode their extreme momentum through the solar system, slowing themselves with their wide translucent fins as they approached their destination, Earth. Wonder twisted into terror as Chu's prophecy burst into reality. With a gleam of fluorescence, the amoebas gushed a thick phlegm towards the planet. 
these gelatinous chunks seemed to be ignited by the atmosphere, flaring up with a brilliant blue light. Then, a rain of blue fire fell upon the earth. When it hit the ground, be it mud, concrete or metal, the fire would melt anything it touched, and set the liquefied remains alight with further flames. In the virtual, people quickly noticed that sometimes others would disappear, or that the world would fail to load certain portions. An unlucky few had no time to check the terrestrial news for an explanation. The blue fire collapsed roofs and melted through VR enclosures, turning flesh into dripping piles of azure candles. It was the future Xu Suma had foreseen, brought to life in the present by whatever cause one cared to preach. Be it the wrath of the cosmos or not, it had been shown prior that amoebas were simply animals. No matter their master, these stellar assailants were material and mortal. Where was the newly refit SI Space Force now? Unfortunately, it was in Murphid, orbiting the great tombstone star of a crushed civilization. This location was chosen because it was relatively far from the prying eyes of the scaly Tuxcan Combine, and because the lay of the hyperlanes rendered it a threshold into the great unknowns of the galactic interior. However, it was the better part of a year's journey from Earth. It seemed the SI was in no position to save humanity. But the end was averted quickly, thanks to Xu Suma. Her expedition ship was being reassembled from the collected pieces outside the Seoul space station. Among the recovered cargo were chunks of amoeba flesh, pieces blasted off the assailants of the unknown victims on the other end of the gate. Despite being thousands of years old, when they were irradiated in the hopes of learning more about the attackers, they immediately regained their fluorescence and new cells pushed their way out through the old. More importantly, the amoebas spitballing Earth began to wave their fins and tack down the solar wind towards the Sol Station. Earth's execution was stayed, and instead, Sol Station was besieged. The amoebas circled it, launching out more of their incendiary bile, but in the vacuum it could not ignite. It was turned away by the force fields around the station, erected to replace the previous asteroid defense measures. This state of affairs simply carried on for months, but the energy needed to maintain the force field was great. It wasn't long before flecks of the hull started to fizzle into gas. Realizing they were going to be melted away before help arrived, the SI crew began fighting back. The station had mass drivers that could stick bits of torn up bulkhead right through the skin of the amoebas. And they were easy enough to hit, each being roughly the size of a few national syndicates combined. Over the months, a few of the amoebas were punched into submission, fading and drifting away as gravity took them. But it was not enough for the station. In March 2221, the force field was fried, and the hull was rapidly being transformed into a congealed mess of sloppy residue. This residue was not especially airtight. In a last bid move, the station was completely powered down, its residents sitting in the emergency lifeboats for oxygen. For a few days they endured hearing the colossal groans of the buckling station, praying to chance that the lifeboats would not feel the dripping of that hateful spit chance favoured them, and the amoebas turned back to Earth. The samples of amoeba flesh died off, and the stalkers outside lost interest. The siege came to an end, and it had been a victory. Several amoebas had been so filled with metal that they were functionally deceased, and enough time had been bought that the Murphid fleet had flashed down lane after lane back to Seoul. Once they arrived, they made a beeline for the amoebas, who were just about to reach Earth. The amoebas seemed to pick up on the threat and turned to hurl more bile at the ships. The rescue fleet was immediately blasted by the astonishingly accurate spitting. Globs of acid could travel for days, then suddenly appear from the darkness and strike dead on, blistering hulls and scrambling sensors. Something of a battle was had, in which the SI ships coarsened the surface of the amoebas with high-energy lasers. That is, until the laser ports were too misshapen and crumbly to be used. 
it was not enough to stop the amoebas, and the SI ships had to flee to avoid total destruction. Here, Xu Suma saved the SI yet again. Her research had unveiled a way to activate hyperlane travel in conventional space, which effectively allowed the craft to zoom away from the battle. However, they zoomed without the guidance of a hyperlane, and would have to fly around with incredible speed until they found an entrance to one, leaving the embrace of the stars as they whizzed around at relativistic speeds. It would be a long time before these wrinkled ships would be seen again, but their intervention had been a success. The amoebas reacted to the scarring the ships had given them by traveling to Sol and simply basking in its energy. They were regenerating their bodies, but this process was not all that fast. Therefore, execution was stayed even further. The SI rushed to build a weapon that could destroy the amoebas, and reveled in the unrivaled attention the whole ordeal was getting from the humans. A genuine war of the worlds was all it took to get terrestrial involvement to triple. Or perhaps it was the evacuations and power outages from the blue fires, which still burned in some parts of the world. For the time being, they had either entered the eye of the storm, or the war was over. While all this had been going on, new discoveries had been flowing in from the distant cosmos. Yushin Ishikawa had compiled evidence of an extinct First League civilization known as the Kamdai. They had lived on the moon of Scat 3, a world covered in liquid water. So covered, in fact, that land was at a premium, leading to endless conflict in Kamdai history. This warrior culture had invaded the First League as soon as they had discovered the hyperlanes, but this venture failed, and they had then joined the League instead. Evidence for all this was scant, and archaeology on Scat 3A was nearly impossible as the two million year old pieces of Kamdai cities were now long since weathered away and subsided into the ocean. Yet a metal artifact preserved in a vacuum case was recovered. It was a bladed melee weapon, which according to an inscription on the case, belonged to an esteemed First League Kamdai soldier. This brought further into question the sophistication of the First League, and counted as a win for the optimist faction within the SI. Their hypothesis was that the League's lack of resource use in their territory was a product not of their swift destruction, but their differing state of technology. It was plausible that they had the means to travel the hyperlanes, or even the means to establish interstellar gateways, but did not possess understanding of the physics behind it all. That is to say, that the members of the League were primitive, in a sense, and had simply stumbled upon some prior technology that brought them to the stars in a very blinkered state. The optimism part was that while they had clearly been destroyed somewhere along the way, their destruction was both a not an immediate reaction to their activity, and slash or b only the result of their limited engineering capacity. Of course, the SI was placed in contrast to this, and what better case in point was needed than the Amoeba War? A combination of curiosity, ingenuity, tenacity and technological sophistication had together saved Earth from a deadly fate which had bested at least one other planet somewhere out there. The damage patterns on First League relics were not consistent with the Amoeba's attacks, but whatever had taken them out, perhaps the SI could stop it. Or, even better, perhaps it simply no longer existed two million years down the line. At the close of 2221, a candidate for the First League destroyers emerged. Pier Meiji had travelled all year through the hyperlanes beyond the old First League borders, reaching the southeastern edge of the galaxy. There she had been greeted by one great voice. A voice that went from garbled sounds to perfect Japanese in just a few minutes. It was the voice of the Oned Karak Collective, to transliterate the crackling title it gave itself. It was a hive-minded super-organism, meaning that while Meiji was looking at a video image of a creature that resembled a very tall hedgehog, this was merely an organ of a greater being, which could only be comprehended when all of the Oned Karak were considered as a whole, just as the work of an ant means nothing without knowing its hive. 
this superorganism was keenly collecting star systems in its corner of the galaxy, and it had no hesitation to share its reasoning. It was securing resources so that it might expand its hive further. It was doing what the SI was doing, in other words, but not because of frivolously applied pressure from a subject population, but because there was no other option thinkable to the hive. The representative spoke of itself in the singular, and denied that there was any sort of leader in their collective. They were of one consciousness, and did not recognize the distinction between different individuals of their species, and individuals is certainly not the correct term, but humans simply did not have a correct term to use here. Despite the complexity of their internal affairs, outwardly the Oneg Karak were clear and simple to understand. They informed Meiji that should humanity ever possess resources that the Collective wanted, the Collective would take them. It was the most matter-of-fact threat one could receive. They were, thankfully, somewhat far away from humanity as it stood. But if they had worked out that humanity was earmarking resources as well, and they probably had given the speed at which they translated human languages, then it was likely that this would give the Collective a wake-up call. With this in mind, the SI began a diplomatic program to try and convince the Hive of the value in leaving humans alone. This was to be value in a purely practical sense. Over the coming years, the Collective would come to understand that there was a threat of unknown forces coming to destroy life. In this, they were far more ready to be paranoid than even the humans. The SI proposed that the humans be allowed to die first in such an event, in order to supply useful data on the nature of such a threat. This was precisely the argument the Collective was looking for, and they eventually expressed a sort of austere respect for humanity, promising to help them prepare for their useful deaths. It was good that the Collective tended to treat humanity as a Collective as well, speaking as if the humans they were talking to were volunteering to die personally. Dying for the Hive was a favorite pastime of the Oned Karak, so they enjoyed these interactions immensely. The SI personnel involved did not, but such was inter-intelligence diplomacy. Back in Seoul, at the close of 2222, the SI moved to interrupt the regeneration of the deadly amoebas. Their lost combat ships had eventually been guided back into the hyperlane system and been refit at the Murphid staging post. There they were joined by six newly built interstellar corvettes, forming the official Sustainability Initiative Space Navy. This force arrived in Seoul ready for battle, but a finishing touch was required. On Earth, people remained relatively terrified of the amoeba presence, and it had become known that the SI had poured all of their stored resources into the construction of these new ships. If they failed, they would be out of options for another year at a minimum. This almost allowed a vote of no confidence in First Peer Torres to reach the final stages. In reaction, she picked out one of the logistics overseers behind the new Corvette project, and shuttled them from the Titan mining zone to join the fleet. This was Jessie Quinn, named Admiral of the Solar System. She was stowed into the cargo hold of one of the Corvettes, for they had no living quarters, and from there she was to command the fleet. This was an easy job, the ship computers had seen enough simulations to give them more experience than any human, but with Quinn there among the ships, the SI were making a show of confidence and giving the cowering onlookers someone to rally behind. The attack went ahead. The new corvettes, designed and built for battle alone, tore through the amoebas with lasers twice as potent as the earlier models. They could only be fired a handful of times before the mountings melted, but that was enough. The beams cut the amoebas open, sliced off their fins and tails, and ignited the blue fire incendiary fluid inside them. The amoebas were silenced with a single pass. The celebrations on Earth were unmatched. This was proof of a long-held contention that humanity could do anything. They had overcome some unknown horror of deep space and made it look easy. Of course, they, humanity, had done nothing but allow the SI to carry on with their plans, 
but now it was the humans willing to consider the species a collective for the purposes of gaining credit in this grand achievement. It was a moment of triumph for SI public relations, but they had a problem. The whole affair had proven that humanity's interest in terrestrial matters was very much tied to the threat the terrestrial posed. In the SI, it was always said that getting people to understand the real world was the key to gaining the mandate they needed to fulfill their mission, to keep humanity alive forever. But at the same time, the mental well-being of their wards had been severely affected by the Blue Fire attacks, and all the further threats one could imagine lay in wait in the stars. Therefore, to some extent, there was great benefit in telling everyone how the Oned Karak Collective was planning to swallow them up into an all-consuming hive mind, and to some extent, this should be kept a secret until the deed was being done, and then some quick scheme would have to avert the crisis, as had been the case in the War of the Worlds. There was no easy answer, and more to the point, there was no answer, because soon enough the next thing came along in the virtual, and the SI was trusted to have done the right thing. In 2223, when they released the latest report on galactic exploration, few felt the need to check it. One noted discovery was a graveyard of ships in deep space, just outside the space of the Uva Zivani. Pir Yushin describes two distinct First League fleets that had been in the Castaba system two million years ago. They were detectable now only via the dust still sailing around the system in the aftermath of their destruction, like the cosmic background radiation from the growth of the universe. That the metallic dust was of First League origin was only known because of the standard hull alloy composition found from previous debris. Some of the dust deviated from this, but that, presumably, was the dust of their opponents. The only strong takeaway was that even the supposedly peaceful and cooperative First League had been fighting wars and deploying member species as warriors against something. This pushed against the factions within the SI that argued they should not carry on flying their gunboats around in the aftermath of their victory. It wasn't clear what it would be yet, but there was military work to be done, and the SI were bound by their founding axioms to carry it out. As things stood, both the Tuxcan Combine and the Oned Karak Collective had stated their willingness to destroy the human race, one out of malice, the other because they saw humans as just rather witty fertilizer. But relations with the Collective carried on improving into 2224, beyond the promise of just dying at a later time of greater convenience. The first sign of this was when Pier Meiji found something impossible. She was exploring the Celebri system on the edge of collective space, but was hailed from the surface of an icy planet by a human. This human claimed to be a member of the SI and spoke several languages, but had no name. Asked for identification, she said she was an exile. This was quickly seen for what it was, a poorly hidden deception by the Collective. The Exile was asking to rejoin the SI and return to her old work exploring the galaxy, proving further that whoever made this facsimile, they didn't know what the SI primarily did. Meiji met with the Exile on board the SIS Zheng He, and was not immediately killed, which was the outcome the terrestrial gamblers were backing. The Exile proved to know quite a lot about science and its application, she was indeed very qualified to work for the SI. Whether she was to be accepted was put to a vote, and in her own defense, the exile recorded a long and poetic rant on the value of considering different beings within a species to be different individuals. The terrestrifiles watching loved it, and the exile was in. Getting an obvious spy under SI control had its uses. And furthermore, Whatever she was reporting back to her masters and presumed creators in the Collective, they seemed to like it. They started inviting SI scientists to come and visit their own worlds. Meiji promised to do it soon, and luckily the Collective had little familiarity with lies. Instead, she carried on staking out the systems directly adjacent to their space. This was in service of a new SI goal to cut off the advance of the Collective and keep them as far from Earth as possible. 
there was a long string of hyperlanes that linked collective space to the SI's corner of the galaxy, and so by securing them all with military measures, the threat of the collective could be kept under control. This philosophy took the initiative into a decade of peace, in which the border of humanity's possessions was advanced closer and closer to the collective, all the while telling the exile that this was how it had forever been. It was a strange, quiet time, although this description only works in contrast to the bursts of discovery that came before and after it. Humans were no longer alone in the universe, but they still had no one to talk to, no one who was at all like them. But life as they knew it was on the way. The Sustainability Initiative had finally stopped pestering its humans with messages about terrestrial goings-on. It was 2226, and their current business needed to be kept a secret. With bated breath, the SI was planning on altering the perception of the hive-minded on it correct, such that a stretch of star systems known as the Primary Belt could be established as human possessions. To achieve this, all the new information streaming in from the analysis of these systems had to be carefully processed in the Night Garden. There was an Earth-like planet in the Cosmalian system at the north end of the primary belt. The SI got to work dumping prefabs all over the surface to give the impression it had been inhabited a long time. Quickly, the Collective's agent, the Exile, was introduced to folk who claimed to have spent their whole lives in the new Lysian syndicates. They told stories of how their grandparents had lived in the lost days of old Lysian and the nasty disease that had wiped the once booming population out. If only the hero explorer Lysian were still alive, this tragedy would never have happened, but they were too busy saving primary belt colonists from space pirates. But that was all in the distant past now. For many years, official discovery logs talked about only expeditions towards the galactic interior. These ended in miserable failure due to the presence of a still surviving First League mining fleet, which was patrolling the western routes of human space. When ships and probes approached, they immediately began to mine them, yet left the asteroids and planets around them intact. Perhaps their main goal was simply to protect their turf until their masters ordered them to begin work. It was all quite disheartening, but the secret news from the primary belt kept the SI's lucky researchers suitably fascinated. There was a system on the edge of the galaxy called Sezutov that had been blasting out unusual radiation patterns ever since it had been observed. Pirmeji found a hyperlane leading to this very system and set off to put the mystery to bed. Would it be an as of yet unclassified type of star, as many eagerly speculated? Even better, the system was host to a huge wormhole, many Earths wide. It was orbiting the unremarkable central star and distorting its signature. The photons captured from the wormhole were of a different signature entirely, confirming that this space-time tear was allowing passage to a corresponding location orbiting a different star. Only photons were making it across, however. A probe sent inside was smashed to pieces as it approached the threshold. Yet with the other side visible to the naked eye, it was impossible not to send more. A similar view must have been taken by the Uva Zivani thousands of years prior. Their interest in the system was clear, most notably through a huge prism in low orbit of Sezutov, framed in carbon alloys and panelled with jade green glass. It was not a structure, but a ruin. Pieces of what had once been a large complex still orbited alongside it, tumbling around and occasionally emitting a fleck of molten metal. They had settled the system, in a sense. There was a large temperate planet with blue oceans and a lively tectonic arrangement. It had its own plant and animal life, but only a few Uvazavani structures dotted here and there. Meiji and her team recovered writings sketched into sandy trays. They called the world Prophet's Retreat and declared it a holy ground. They remarked with awe at how the asteroid belt in the system's interior would sometimes pass in front of the star, and more of that jade glass would create a mesmerizing spectral eclipse worthy of religious revelation. 
In overview, the planet's consistent climate and large size made it more suitable for human life than Earth, especially considering the unspoilt state of this Eden world. The Uvazavani knew it. Meiji's presence had been detected by long dormant listening posts, and a steady stream of threats was spat from the SI translation algorithms until Pier Meiji and crew departed. It was made clear what the ancient empire and their unthinkable secret weapons were ready to do if Prophet's retreat was violated. All this simply had to be passed on to the Onid Karak Collective, giving humans a nice excuse to have not obviously built up a rich region so close to the Collective's domain. Meiji contented herself to studying the so-called space cows instead. These were cosmic beings that flung themselves from planet to planet, supping on atmospheric goodness in low orbit, then launching themselves off to the next pasture. A curiosity, and one that drew sympathy from the humans, especially given what was likely to happen to these gentle grazers should the collective move on in. They had a bulky, easy-to-print shape, something like a very large squid or jellyfish, so the new Save the Whales campaign was easy to initiate. That this curious Cassus belly was being generated was not commented upon by the initiative. They weren't the only creatures washing through the terrestrial content filters. During what was dubbed the awkward decade of the 2230s, a task of infinite magnitude churned along. The SI was slowly cataloguing all the life on the dozen or so moons and planets it had popped up on. It would take many lifetimes to find all the nooks and crannies of a single world, and on the SI's withered budget, it was simply impossible. But the biggest, cutest, coolest and ugliest creatures of each world got special treatment. Most ecosystems had at least one fluffy round lump with stereoscopic vision and hearing, and that was all people needed to see. There was one habitable planet that stood out above the rest. It was called Fen Habanis III at first. The Fen Habanis system was a curiosity in itself, being clearly visible on the First League space map, but proving almost impossible to track down. Pier Yushin eventually turned over a few asteroids and found a very small hyperlane that shot out towards the galactic rim. On the other end was Fen Habanis III, capital of the First League. It was an ecumenopolis, or world city. The whole planet was covered in piles upon piles of two million year dead civilization. It was a gold mine, academically and commercially. The air was breathable, but setting foot on the metallic upper strata of the surface kicked up trapped gases from the lost world below. Traversing the dead world was equal parts fascinating and depressing. Analysis of the fallen materials allowed reverse simulation to establish their rough original shape. Yushin constructed an image of a city defined by towers stretching high into the sky, and indeed deep into the ground, with uneven patches that might have been windows. In between the towers, ground level construction was rarely more than two stories high and was sparsely arranged. However, other ruin simulations suggested that even more towers had been on those sites, only to be torn down. More text and data artifacts were recovered, and at last a complete translation of the First League script was possible. Doing so revealed the downfall of their capital world. It seemed that the world had depended greatly on food grown in other systems, and that this food supply had very suddenly halted when their era was over. They referred to the goings-on in the galaxy only as the War, and spoke of the First League's member species leaving the Alliance to fight. What they were fighting, or whether they were fighting each other, appeared to be deliberately omitted from the records. But what happened after was detailed with a sense of pride. It seems that while something consumed the galaxy, the rulers of Fen Herbanis had arranged for an experimental device to be deployed at their sole hyperlane. The records described it as pinching the lane. Whatever it was, it was the cause of the lane being so difficult to find, and not responding to the usual hyperjump engine mathematics. Fen Habanis had hidden itself away to avoid doom, but with no food, doom could be homegrown. Many of the planet's towers were torn down to try and balance the planet's ecology and prepare to mass-produce food, 
but the plan had ultimately failed. The trillion beings of Fen Hibanis had passed on over the course of two centuries, and the latest records spoke of failed experiments with solar power and digitized consciousness. They had seen a way out of starvation, but perished on the way. They left behind a rotten pile of city, and the chance for the sustainability initiative to learn some lessons. But again, how they were meant to preserve humanity against a catastrophic but unspecific downfall was hard to determine. The only clear message was that automatic mining drones last forever, since they were increasingly found across the galaxy. In 2232, Jesse Quinn rode the SI Space Navy beyond Murphid to do battle with a fleet of these drones. There was a mining headquarters blocking the exit to a hyperlane a couple of jumps from the Murphid staging post, cutting the SI off from portions of the galaxy not yet promising to kill or eat the humans. Quinn cut a path through the faithful machines and opened up a route to the Cosmos Incognita of the Galactic Northeast. This region had thus far given out little information. There were no obvious signals like those the Tuxcan Combine produced, and the First League map did not cover that quadrant, and the freshly discovered maps that did simply catalogued the stars and related bodies. But eventually, by chance, a meeting would occur in that quiet, forgotten realm. The Exile was tasked with exploring the area, strategically far from the Collective. In 2236, she detected a cylindrical ship drifting on iron engines. It was transmitting a complex repeating pattern of numeric sequences. Every human who could possibly take joy in trying to decode it was already in the SI's employ, so they were set to work at once. And it was a joy, for the transmissions were so structured that each layer of analysis gave clues that led to another. This was a carefully constructed puzzle box, and inside was a hyperlane map and a frequency matrix that could be fed into the hyperlane monitor probes. Doing so revealed a strangely familiar face. What appeared to be a bald human with a ridged scalp and blue skin was sending video data down the hyperlanes. They spoke in English with an accent mixing that of various Earth syndicates, but pausing for too long between phrases in order to take very sharp breaths. The phrases were rather pleasant. This figure introduced themselves as the elected envoy of the sovereign Bebaki coalition, Bibaki being the name of these blue-faced beings. When first Pier Torres answered the introduction, the envoy was alarmed. There were a lot of questions about how Torres's eyes, nose, mouth and lips were unmistakably Bibaki. Torres saw it the other way, of course. For both species, a Pandora's box of evolutionary history had burst open. The Babaki weren't just humanoid, they were human-esque, and the probability of this happening without a shared history was infinitesimal. The natural histories compiled by both races made convincing cases that their authors were of the original evolutionary branch, and the Babaki had no reservations about bringing big data and evolutionary simulations to the table to prove their case. Such was their way, and that this was their way was a true gift. The Babaki, as near human as they were, had grown up on a planet with sparse vegetation and plenty of permafrost. As such, they explained, they had developed their natural ingenuity and built great rings of ice in which their civilization made stride after stride. They had a tradition of acquiring deep understanding of adventure before embarking upon it, for in their history their sparse planet gave no second chances. They looked before they leapt, and so while that made them seem a little less human, it brought them into the almost desperate arms of the sustainability initiative. The Sovereign Coalition had their own subject population of voters in virtual realms, but they were fully engaged with the terrestrial, not that the Babaki made the virtual terrestrial distinction in that way. For them, the virtual world was a place of experiment and the real world a place of execution. The popularity of scientific work among the population meant that while they were too a democracy, they had all the resources for academic pursuits they could ask for. How could an SI bureaucrat not immediately fall in love with this lost sister species? 
and they looked human enough so the love could be perfectly hormonal too. Putting evolutionary past and future aside, the Babaki had a lot to offer the humans. Most important was an invitation to the so-called galactic community. For centuries, humans had wondered when a curtain would be pulled back and they would join a vibrant life that surely existed across the galaxy. At long last, they were brought in from the cold. First, the Babaki introduced Torres to one Executor Shadligam, who was a large purple bag of lighter-than-air gases crowned with noduled tendrils. He was a Gorf, who biologically were best classified as a flying fungus. A machine was deftly translating the motions of his tendrils into a shrill-sounding Babaki language, which then morphed again into carefully enunciated English, giving the gaseous blob a very dignified persona. These Gorf were the primary constituents of a polity called the Union of Gorfis. They were spacefaring and had been working with the Babaki for centuries. Their territories were somewhat intertwined, with the Gorf majority region being mostly on the other side of the Babaki region, which itself ran from three jumps west of Murphid to the northern edge of the galaxy. Together, the two powers were called the Interstellar Alliance. But who was calling them that? This was answered at the next round of introductions. Torres and the SI Council of Peers were invited to join a virtual meeting, using software the Babaki had rapidly prototyped. Doing so led the humans into a chamber surrounded by walls of data readouts, which were being translated rapidly into each peer's language as they observed it. But they did not observe it for long, for right in front of them began to appear crowds of other attendees. There was a group of Bibaki, just a single stoic drone of the Onid Karak, and a cadre of Tuxcan wearing armor as scaly as their skin. As for all the other unfamiliar faces, some introductions were in order. The SI realized that they were very late to the galactic party. It so happened that human space had been cut off from a lot of the Hyperlane system, both by its layout and by the presence of First League aggressors in their quadrant. The galactic community was most amused to discover that the uncharted zone was crawling with hairy, scared-looking creatures. The matter of Bibaki human symmetry elevated interest further. Thus, the SI was rapidly interrogated by envoys of three more galactic powers. First were the Eurasian Harmonious Administration, who ruled the lanes on the other side of the Interstellar Alliance. Beyond them, in the northwestern corner of the galaxy, were the Silstech Sovereign Stars, another democratic union earmarked to join the Alliance in the future. To their south, in the galaxy's western quadrant, was the Fajesivlin Holy Assembly. They also carried the spirit of democracy, but only because their religion told them to, which was most of the rationale behind everything else they did too. The Fajasivlin and Eurasians shared a bond in this regard, and they together called themselves the Pan-Galactic Coalition, a name that revealed their ambitions, perhaps. All this was very nice, but the humans just wanted to know what these distant creatures looked like. To summarize, the Eurasians were small and thin, resembling a cross between a mole and a rabbit, with an evolutionary history to match. The Silstak were arthropods, resembling overgrown caterpillars with a disc-shaped sensory organ sitting upon their foreend like a hat. The Fajasivlin were very close to what humans called fungal, looking like a mushroom grown to the height of a tree, with a bioluminescent trunk that did all the talking. In summary, they all appeared as strange to the humans as the humans appeared to them, and all the comparisons made to animals and plants of their home planets were just as rough and patronizing. What was this cast of assembled creatures doing? Politics. The meeting was the galaxy-wide negotiating table, developed over recent decades for the purpose of mass policy making. It was interspecies democracy, which came with a variety of challenges. First and foremost, the whole system could only run as fast as the species with the slowest decision-making process could allow. This ensured that the final say on any matter would go to the Gorfs, and that say would be had once every couple of years. The big issue on the table in 2238 was the mass adoption of recycling regulations. 
Yes, the SI had found their home among the stars. They cast their vote for the motion to begin the many stages of ratification. For the Onid Karak representative, also present for the first time, this was all fascinating, although perhaps only for it gave them more models for their spy masters to sculpt. Showing up late to the vote, if such a thing was possible, was the final power at the table, the Justcan hierarchy. This was a large autocratic empire of stocky, furry, well-dressed, goat-horned quadrupeds who occupied the southern quadrant of the galaxy. They were, in their own words, beyond democracy, but were perfectly happy to participate in the petty galactic polling. The Justcans explained to the SI that they enjoyed such a wealth of data on the goings-on of their population that democracy was a fruitless burden. Their autocrats were well aware what was best for their subjects, so they just got on with it. Again, the SI found themselves looking into a magic mirror and seeing what they most desired. The ways in which the galactic community reflected back onto the humans were perhaps the most impactful changes the SI experienced in this sudden era of diplomacy. After all, these other species did not have an enormous amount they wanted to say to the gangly humans. They were happy to speak to the Babaki and presume that humans were some vassal race of their wiser, bluer kin. Indeed, it was the Babaki who were credited when the SI built up the courage to present their findings on the First League to the Assembly. The SI was left in a state of anxiety, where they knew only one person at the party, and even that person was a little unnerved by the rather primal nature of their new guest. The SI were quick to insist that the behaviour of their subjects in the virtual was not to be taken as the SI's endorsed terrestrial philosophy. But again, the Babeki were not so able to make this distinction. At the metaphorical dinner table, the humans were seated at the far end next to the bad-mannered Tuxcan and close to the conspicuous Onid Karak who paced around their chair without sitting in it. It was from here that the SI would now have to evaluate their mission. A galaxy with enough energy and resources to carry humanity beyond the foreseeable future was probably not going to be at their disposal. And the risk remained that what they already had would end up being at the disposal of others. The long and groggy awakening of humanity as a galactic power was over. Now they were dropped into the middle of a great game, and it was sink or swim. It was time to show the galaxy what the thin-skinned mammals from the uncharted backwaters could do. The dour pessimists of the SI, increasingly headquartered in the Night Garden, had to rethink their theories. The scheduled doom the space amoebas were due to bring had not come about, and now the whole galaxy was revealed to be alive with civilizations new and old. Seeing the blocks of colour on the star charts made one feel much less alone. Human space was safely tucked into a herd of other societies. Surely nothing could destroy them all. That sentiment was as powerful as it was misguided. Civilization was mere specks in a void, tied together by hyperlanes that, as the First League had proven, were not guaranteed to be stable. On Scat 3A and Fenhabanis 3, two primary League worlds, SI crews were delving deep in search of clues, but were turning up nothing but precious metals and rich alien fauna. Seeing this, larger extraction facilities were arranged, for in the new great game of the galaxy, resources not stockpiled were resources closer to the claws of others. Clearly optimism had not won out yet. Indeed, the SI was beginning to actively encourage residents of their expanding cities on extrasolar planets. This was driven by two products of their initiation to galactic politics. First was a rule of the voting chamber, in which one's vote was weighted through a so-called stake algorithm. This determined what right the voter had to influence a given matter, and was roughly proxy for the power a civilization had over a decision. One aspect of the algorithm was a count of population, using a standardized system of measure based on how much energy one could exert. To put it another way, there were lots of Gorths, so they would dominate a count of mere separate entities, 
but each gorf did little on its own, so they were weighted lightly. Compared to the Fajazivlin, who were rare but deeply computational, a fair system was needed to determine how many things each power was representing. This weighted population count was the solution. The implication was that humans needed to multiply to ensure their voice was heard, and ensuring their voice was heard would serve the SI mandate. Therefore, reproductive rights were untethered, and a human diaspora began. The second factor at play was the intervention of the Babaki in human engineering. The same technology that allowed galaxy-wide policymaking in near real time could also be used to link up the virtuals of the various human colonies to the primary servers on Earth, and indeed to the Babaki equivalent. It was known as hyperlinking, on account of operating a little like a hyperlane, only on a quantum scale. With this arrangement, where one lived on the terrestrial mattered a lot less, driving wave after wave of passenger transport ships out from Earth. Some of them travelled a long, long way, beyond Murphid, beyond humanity. Thin, cyan-streaked ships passed the other way. This was the landmark moment that closed out the year 2240, the first interspecies migrations. Humans donned their thermals and stepped into frigid Babaki habitats. Babaki deployed entropic ventilators to stay cool amid the waste heat of human apartment blocks. It was a limited experiment to begin with, but this was a turning point for the SI. If their goal was to preserve humanity forever, what were they meant to do with the human-esque migrants amid their ranks? Or indeed, what could they do without them? The Babaki had already proven themselves both benevolent friends and invaluable allies, but the SI was constitutionally mandated to act otherwise if push came to shove. As things stood, with not a push in sight, the Babaki carried on advocating for human legitimacy to the galactic community. In 2241, an important development pushed humans out of the firing line. They ceased to be the new creatures in the club. A growing power from the southern rim of the galaxy had made contact with a deep space exploration mission led by Pier Meiji, and she quickly routed their comms through the Hyperlane network. Now the humans got a chance to pull back someone else's curtain. This new civilization was announced by freshly elected first Pier Otter, a rare privilege indeed. Who they were was almost secondary to this, but they were of interest all the same. They called themselves Ultur, or sometimes a word that roughly translated to the tribes. They were aquatic beings with a recently discovered penchant for land loving. In appearance, they were like corals, with a rich variety of colours among them. Each being had two particular colours they sported, a primary and a secondary. From their calcified bodies protruded arms like those of a squid, numbered seemingly at random from being to being. These were poked through thin veils of ruffled cloth, which was dyed in the primary colour of each individual, and covered with jewellery shimmering in their secondary colour. Altogether, they had a striking yet unsettling look, but any fear one felt was misguided, for they had no use for confrontation. They were entirely delighted to work with the galaxy, leaking bubbling fluids from pores in their coral heads, a good sign as it turned out. The interest in cooperation was so strong as to be sinister. They would gain a reputation for being openly sour at the success of others, for it was in the failure of others that they sought chances to reach out and provide aid, thus furthering their mutualist goals. As such, they were entirely against the matter of mandatory recycling regulations, which was still the matter of the day after years of deliberation. With this in mind, the Ulter were not especially popular, but they either did not understand this, or were happy to wait for ends to justify their means. Domestically, in the 2240s, the SI was racing for the galaxy's northern edge. The layout of the hyperlanes was such that the northeast corner of the galaxy was accessible only through human-controlled areas around Murphid, or from the Babaki northern frontier. 
As such, it was natural that one or the other would ultimately expand into the region. The SI, to preserve humanity forever, had to get there first. The Bebeki, knowing full well what the SI were planning to take from them, did nothing. While the Babaki could be just as confrontational as the humans, they considered the humans not just allies, but as a kind of wealth. Humans were fascinating to study, and the best of them could help with higher science, the deepest and utmost fascination of the Babaki elites. This meant that no formal complaints were lodged as the SI cynically began claiming all the key hyperlane junctions of the northeast. The claiming process was quite simple, thanks to existing galactic law. The notion of territory in space was a little ambiguous, especially given that almost all the so-called territory a power could claim was just vacuum. But hyperlane entrances meant something, habitable planets meant something, and unprospected asteroid belts and gas giants meant a whole lot. Therefore, it was deemed legal to add a solar system to a government's jurisdiction under three conditions. One, that the jurisdiction did not extend past the termination shock boundary of the star. This was the distance at which the solar wind no longer pushed back the interstellar medium through which the star travelled. Two, that the solar system had to contain at least one micro-pop of the government's primary species. That was about two to three hundred people for humans. And three, that hyperlane communications probes were to be established and maintained by the governing body. Therefore, groups of two to three hundred SI staff were constantly having their offices relocated to cramped, rapidly assembled space stations in a variety of no-name systems along the Babaki frontier. As long as some other office somewhere was making sure food haulers kept on stopping by, these were peaceful little void dustbins to inhabit. In 2243, there was a particularly thrilling 4D experience circulating in the virtual. It was a clip from the Evendari monitoring channel, showing off an enormous explosion in the middle of their bluer-than-blue ocean. The SI's pets had come across nuclear fission. This was the point in the story where the SI should sweep down and reveal themselves to prevent the Evendari from destroying their planet. But that was not as dramatic as seeing how close they actually got, and furthermore, Non-intervention was vital to the social experiments the scientists in the Overwatch station above were carrying on. Therefore, a potent window for making contact came and went, and all were happier for it. By 2246, Pir Yushin had almost led the human expeditions right to the edge of the galaxy. There, in quiet systems far from the dust, radiation and rogue bodies of the interior, a new class of life drifted into view. Yushin reported that flotillas of living rock were cruising in wide orbits of stars. Their life was evidenced by their reaction to being approached. Normally a greyish-white in colour, they shimmered blue and emitted powerful electromagnetic fields when SI probes tumbled towards them. The probes were fried, and then when all was clear, the huge crystalline beings became inert once more. The Babaki had logged these on their own expeditions, and called them Sapphire Quintessences. That was a very Babaki name, so the SI called them Crystal Sovereigns. Years-long study of how they were licking out with electromagnetic fields was the first major joint study of human and Babaki scientists. It was a powerful union. For the Babaki could determine how a phenomena worked, while the humans determined how to use it to save resources. A decade later, a particular fashion of wiring solar arrays would owe its existence to Yushin's mad dash for the frontier. The Exile was also conducting expeditions in the region, focusing on the uncharted zone that Yushin's flag planting had now cut off from the galactic community. She discovered the first of 2249's three great relics. On Barban 3A, a dead moon at the end of a long, lonely hyperlane to the rim, she found a computer the size of a space station. It was buried underground and was processing something. That much was clear from the spikes in magnetism when its pillarous processes crescendoed in waves of activity. 
its power source was assumably buried further still. The Exile was about to destroy the machine and bring the parts back to the SI for a reward, but her not entirely human philosophy didn't appreciate the lifeness of a computer in the same way the Council of Peers did. Pier Otter ordered the Exile to leave it alone, and if there was anything her non-human mindset excelled at, it was following orders. Signal analysis was performed, and by tracking the movement of electrons through the labyrinthine machine, an emulator was developed. With this, the SI could determine that the computer had been running for thousands of years, and was attempting to brute force a solution to a mathematical problem. The problem was unknown, and given the complexity of what the machine was doing to find solutions, it was going to stay that way. However, the fact that the SI attempted to find it did not go undetected by the machine itself, which quietly slipped a message off through something akin to a hyperlink. Then came the discovery of the second relic. It was on a planet dubbed Unity by the rapidly assembled pseudo-colony the SI had built there. Unity was on the primary belt to the collective, and was a show home of sorts. This lovely Earth-like planet had a secret below its oceans, and in 2249 it was dragged to the surface, an intact spaceship from 7,000 years prior. It was not just intact, but perfectly preserved. It was a battle cruiser, rounded and armoured in the front, and bristling with emitters and ports to the rear. The interior was very spacious for humans, as whatever had crewed it was clearly much bigger than them. There were a few manually controlled elements inside, the shape of which indicated opposable thumbs and great strength assumed of the user. Playing with the controls brought a surprise. The ship suddenly powered on and flung itself into space without warning. It was being repelled by the planet's gravity. Several robots and three real explorers were flattened by the force of it. Then the cruiser hung in orbit and pinged out a signal in all directions. The signal was clearly an intelligent message, but the language was unknown. This was no Uwe Zivani wreck, as had been the leading speculation, given its proximity to their sleeping domain. It belonged to those who replied to the signal. Those who had been missing a battlecruiser for a very long time. They were the Imatharans, or as they quickly came to be known, the Imatharan ancients. To them, the Uwe Zivani were mere children too. They were the third relic of 2249 and Relic was all they were, for how they existed then was less than a shadow of how they had lived when the battle cruiser had first set sail. They had holed themselves up in a cluster of stars west of the Justcan, in the southwestern portion of the galaxy. Surrounded by singularities and thick nebulae, they had sat back and monitored the galaxy for millennia. They noted their surprise at how quickly and readily the humans had stepped up to join the galactic community. It was like a compliment from the head teacher. The Imatharans are best described as upright standing horses in typically golden regalia, with nostrils high on their face right beside their side-facing monocular eyes. They were long lived to the point of immortality, compared to human lifespans anyway and they concerned themselves with business that they claimed could not be explained to others. Keeping an eye on the galaxy was a side hobby of sorts, but they gave ready assurances that no one need pay them any attention. At one time they had warred with the Uva Zavani, but in that era, 6,000 years prior, the galaxy had been quiet and empty. 3,000 years further back, it had been different, they explained but they were not planning to divulge the story of the previous generation of galactic spacefarers. They said that only they and the Uva Zavani passed the threshold, and they had both warred with each other in the aftermath. Now the Imutharans had no need for war, so little so that they were happy for the SI to keep the battlecruiser. After lengthy lessons on its operation, it flew to the new SI forward operation station in the SCAT system, the military command post from which the Uva Zavani and Tuxcan Combine were being monitored. It was a show of force, the language of humanity's belligerent rivals. 
the cruiser itself was a magnificent work of engineering, and reverse engineering an automatic version for use with a hyperlinked human crew could bring about a new wave of military innovation in time. The Imitharans sent Justcan scientists to aid the endeavour, and from the way the Justcan spoke of their sponsors, it was obvious they had been secretly aware of the ancients previously. An official diplomatic congratulations on becoming worthy enough was sent from the Justcan Ascendancy, which was a fancy title for their central, all-powerful, all-knowing government. This period of cooperation led to the first migrations of Justcan to SI worlds at the beginning of the 2250s. At the same time, migrating Babaki were bringing along their companion Gorths, and the legal regulations required to manage that opened the borders up for Gorths to independently live in human colonies as well. The SI wards were now four species wide, albeit the non-humans were negligible in number. This would not remain the case, for these other species could further the SI mandate in a unique way. The Juskan could live well in arid conditions, and the Babaki thrived in the cold. Plans were drawn up for colonies on planets with ecosystems hostile to humans, but tolerable to the aliens. In this way, the labour of the non-humans could be used to create infrastructure and extract resources that the SI as a whole would own and could direct to the humans at their own discretion. A complete system along these lines was far off, but from the very beginning of alien migration, these ideas were circulating at the highest level of the SI, whether they wanted to entertain them or not. It was not an especially ethical arrangement, but in theory, the colonists would be voting citizens and could be elected. In practice, the chance of the humans actually electing a just can, who came across as extremely arrogant, were slim. The Babaki fared better, but it took a certain level of education to appreciate their tightly woven poetics and sharp, manic speech. So then, a minority of others was not going to thrive democratically speaking, and for the time being, it favoured the SI to maintain the illusion that this was anything other than the fault of the democratic rules themselves. This caused a divide as rapid as it was irreparable. There were hundreds of SI peers and administrators who had strong philosophical objections to using alien labour for human means. Labour colonialism, it was dubbed, or capitalism even. The SI Council of Peers were stone-faced, having no especially viable response other than to appeal to a literalist reading of the hundred-year-old SI mandate. It was not convincing enough. In 2255, SI rogues gathered a few weaponized ships and blocked the hyperlane in the Tua system in protest. This was a lane that linked Earth's local group of stars to the branches of the hyperlane leading to the primary belt and all the mines of the less fake than ever colonies. The SI would have to listen, the rogues thought. But instead, the SI thought only of reopening the lane and silencing this armed descent. As it happened, they had a quick way to do it. The method hinged upon the re-emergence of space amoebas, which were quite numerous in the galactic northeast. They did not appear to be native to any particular place, but had perhaps been driven there by the rise of civilization across the galaxy. Now they were very much in the way, and they made their presence very clear by destroying two of the SI's tin can stations in the region. For that purpose, the SI Space Navy had been assembled and deployed, sailing from the forward base on the other side of the blockade. They blasted into the Tua system with lasers charged, cutting through the blockade from a distance, then closing in to silence the pieces. Under normal circumstances, it would have been possible to keep this whole affair internal, but the rogues had enhanced their protest by having a few of the blockade ships be crewed in person. Among the debris now in distant orbit of Toa was blood. The SI worked quickly and efficiently. The debris was ejected into deep space within a few days, and even sooner, news of the event was published. The pirates of Toa had been defeated. Good news. It was strange that pirates would suddenly make such a brazen move, but the SI had rightfully punished them for it, 
and the ringleaders had been captured alive, so no long-term harm was done. Then, the actual SI personnel killed in the action were slipped in among the dead listed on reports of amoeba attacks. It was by no means the end of the matter, for the vast majority of the rogues were not only still at large, but still doing their day jobs within the very SI that was being so intolerant of them. It was a rather measured kind of protest, to say the least. But now that lives had been lost, the matter was debated openly in the Council of Peers and lesser assemblies. These debates always reached the ultimate impasse that while the aliens had been given the legal right to colonize SI worlds, the SI couldn't budget for bringing them in if their labor wasn't colonized in return. Trapped at this juncture, the status quo reigned and other matters knocked at the door. The big event that finally swept these ethics debates off the landing pages came in 2257, in the midst of the unannounced, unnamed war with the northern space amoebas. The SI fleet had pacified the already claimed systems, and was about to press out down the next untapped lane to clear the path ahead, but suddenly they were not needed. A massive flotilla of irregular, scarred ships fell from the hyperlanes on the east side of the Stebnar system, just as Jesse Quinn and the SI fleet fell in from the west. The unknown flotilla ploughed forwards into a swarm of amoebas, including the recently discovered mother amoeba species, five times the size of the previously encountered variant, and lined with flagella strong enough to cut a spaceship in half. For all their strength, they melted away when the flotilla released a barrage of explosive projectiles and focused energy beams. Within minutes, the luminescent host was dead, and the SI Navy was left bow to bow with a silent battle fleet. An exchange of signals was made, but neither side could comprehend the other, so it was back to square one, transmitting mathematical axioms and translation keys. Pessimists were again ready for doom to be announced, but this wasn't it, either. This meeting would in fact begin to reveal a piece of the Imatharin puzzle that had been deliberately misplaced. It was a piece that would set the SI on a path to war.